Radio. Hello and welcome to Cryptocurrent, the only podcast to bring you beginner and advanced knowledge of cryptocurrency and blockchain, analyses of cryptocurrency markets, and discussions on growing a business within the crypto space. Stay tuned and stay Cryptocurrent. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cryptocurrent. Your host here, Richard Karth, on. And today we have a really cool guest that um, one of our previous guests that were on the show, uh, Raina with Gilded, um, did an introduction for me recently and uh, been excited to get uh, this next person on the show for a while. And without further ado, we have Samantha with Bitcoin Pizza. How are you doing today? How's it going? I'm doing uh, really well. And shout out, special shout out to Reina for introducing us. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Gilda's doing some great stuff. And they just got back from Techstars, been doing some fundraising, been doing uh, closing deals. It's It's been exciting to see all the, the growth that's been coming with them. But i um, super excited to get you on the show. You've, you've had quite the journey yourself and uh, excited to dive into that a little bit and just learn a little bit more about you. So um, for... You know, to get us started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Give us some background. Sure. I mean, that that can go on forever, so I'll try and keep it short. Um, my name is Sam. Some people call me Sam Rad because my last name is actually Radakia. It's a very complicated uh, Italian last name, so they I got this nickname growing up where people would just pause and say, "I like it." Rad. Because yeah, I, and, I definitely punted on saying it, so I'm glad you did. <laughs> yeah, no, I exactly. You're like Samantha, and some people would start and then they stop, and so I just kind of owned it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I I'm very interested. I got into the space through kind of a weird but somewhat common way, which was I grew up. I have two brothers. We're very close in age. Um, They were into gaming, so therefore I was into gaming. Um, It's kind of what we did as a family. And I I did a lot of uh, kind of competition on the weekend before esports was like a thing. And um, ultimately, once I got to college, convinced my uh, department to let me actually like study in-game worlds from the human behavior, neuroscience and anthropology perspective. So um, that's when I got into this like in world, uh, world of Warcraft and Second Life and seeing virtual exchange and then became familiar with crypto, well, Bitcoin at the time. It wasn't, we weren't like saying crypto as an industry. And right. Well, yeah, l- I mean, let's, let's dive into that real quick. Right. So um, really cool that you were able to finesse your job into like letting you do what you love and to get paid to do something that you're very passionate about. But you said you started to learn about uh, crypto and in different ways that it applies to gaming, but like still getting your initial taste of it around. What is this? Uh, what's the timeline? So um, what year is it? And, and what was your first introduction to the world of cryptocurrency and blockchain? Yeah, so this was 2010 or 2011. And I wouldn't, this was just when I was in college and I was like trying to basically make the world like work for me. I was like, I want to study gaming and anthropology. And they wouldn't let me. And I got the, you know, the department to let me. And then, you know, I was, it was the middle of like the recession after 2008. So obviously the creation of Bitcoin happened. But also from my perspective, I'm like, shit, I have a liberal arts degree. Like, no one's going to become journalists or lawyers or doctors. Like, what's going on? So right. I started a company. So at the same time that I became familiar with this kind of notion of... I wouldn't even say crypto. I'd say like digital assets and the fact that you could make money or make value. Like things that you know could have impacts in, in the physical world in like a virtual or digital environment. That's became when I became aware of it. Um, but I started a company that was totally unrelated and it was like Pandora, like a fashion recommendation algorithm, um, which was quite popular at the time. So it, it took me in some slightly directions and entrepreneurial side, you know, building a few companies that moved into the direction of either 
you know, retail or supply chain and things like this, but there was always a passion and kind of, you know, awareness of um, at least Bitcoin. So, which I is really cool. It. Well, I mean, yeah. the, the fact that you started this, that you knew about it as early as you did in 2010, like, wow, you're in the game super early. And then to be able to build your own entrepreneurial company um, in fashion. And then, um, as you were saying, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I mean, I wouldn't even, a lot of people, there's so many people that were involved at various points in times. I wouldn't even say involved, you know, I like, I, I saw it, I became familiar with it. It was fascinated, but I don't think I like to be quite honest, fully grasped the level, like the, what was going on on a macro scale. Like one, I was very young. I don't know. I was in college. I'm like, going out to parties and like doing that thing. So I wasn't thinking about the fact of like, huh, what is money? Who creates money? Who controls money? Do what is a nation state? All these like really, really big questions that, you know, at the root of it, when you start to understand why Bitcoin caught on when it did, even though other, other similar projects were proposed earlier, um, in cryptography and in the term blockchaining has been around for quite some time. So it just, then I started to get it as I became, I guess, more aware of global geopolitics and, and the shift, the sociocultural shifts that are taking place right now. And, and all of the kind of messed up things that have happened in result of you know, internet monopolies and data monopolies. So like, I don't know, it took some time kind of working in the industry, like as an entrepreneur and realizing no matter what traditional company I start, whether it's in this industry or that industry or doing this topic or that topic, I mean, no matter what, it's still the same end game. And it's still the same, it's you're playing still within the confines of the same game. And then I kind of like freaked out and was like, Oh, this the whole system is messed up. <laughs> right. Then I, then I got it. I'm like, oh, right. That's what this is it's like this is a new system. We're like breaking the game. Um, and as a gamer, and I end, I went on to study in my master's game design and and these things. So like I appreciate the roots, particularly in cryptography, of like game theory and some of these mathematical concepts. Not as a mathematician, just as like. I don't know. It's all, it's about human behavior and trust and consensus and these things. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I've had a weird journey, but I mean, everyone I meet in the space is fairly eclectic. So I think it's the land of misfit toys. Definitely. And, and there's, there's just such an energy and a spark to people that are in the space and, and just see where this is going and where it's headed and to be in it as early um, as we are. Cause even though this is, nine years old, about to work on, you know, being 10 years old, it's, it's still so early and at the forefront. And as you were kind of saying, so it was on your radar back in 2010, but you started learning about it, started getting deeper and deeper into it with cryptography and started to really, really get really good at understanding the basis of what Bitcoin is. And so you created a book called Bitcoin Pizza. So why did you write this book? And, you know, how did you come up with the name and around the time, around what time did you uh, release this book? Yeah. Oh, well, that was still, I mean, midway through my journey. So I'd say in 2014 is when I came back into crypto and I was living, I had had a rude awakening after my first company and, and exiting that company and selling it and seeing that like, you know, this tech world is still kind of a little messed up. And uh, that's, I came back into crypto living in the mountains of Park City, Utah, and just like met a bunch of people there super into it. And then ended up co-founding a company around that time uh, called Chronicled. And so we were building a lot of solutions on the enterprise or, or infrastructure layer. So during the time of, of working in that company, so from 20... 14 through present. I mean, I've recently moved into an advisory role, but basically for like the past five years, I realized we're building these awesome things and and products and not deep crypto products. They were like enterprise supply chain things. And people still didn't understand the technology 
but more so they didn't understand why it was important. So you'd go into right. like a conference or a boardroom pitch and people would just like, including our own team members and my co-founders would like jump into like, here's how proof of work works. And this is what proof of stake is. And like, you have Alice and you have Bob and they do this thing. And I, I just watch people like fall asleep in a room. And I, it was over the course of doing like multiple years of terrible education and people who just, you know, we were not as an industry doing a good job of making it relatable or entertaining that I found myself blogging, explaining, like giving, creating metaphors. Um, but beyond that, even just there were these cultural aspects of the industry that I found like my family members or, or friends or people not in the industry were asking about like, what's Bitcoin pizza day? Why do you talk about Lamborghinis a lot? Um, what, <laughs> right. what is to the moon? Like what is HODL? What are all these weird crypto Twitter people saying? Why are people anonymous? And so the book started really as I was making like a glossary of terms and trying to just make it fun and relatable. And I talked to someone, they're like, yeah, this is like, I thought it was going to be just the A to Z's of crypto. But I had some advice from people saying like, you should turn this into a book, like make it more of a narrative and, you know, incorporate elements of culture and why it's important. So the book goes through, I mean, it's like a primer for people who've heard about Bitcoin, crypto or blockchain or their boss has told them to learn about it, it's the next thing. And they're going to like blockchainify their business or whatever the hell they're saying. And, yeah. you know, they, they want to like understand, it. they're not thinking about it in their daily lives and they want to know what's going on. Um, so it does go through, there's a lot about kind of the underpinning, like Bitcoin, but there's also a lot that's like there are no coiners and there are shit coins and there's enterprise blockchain. There's like this whole landscape that's evolved in whether or not you agree with, you know, whether I've had a lot of feedback, you know, Bitcoin maximalists, for example, be like, I hate this because you have blockchain in the title. And it's not about blockchains. They're just the blockchain, the Bitcoin right. blockchain. And then enterprise blockchain people are like, oh, there's a chapter on Bitcoin. It's like way too crypto. We don't trust that stuff. So the point was to provide a survey of the culture and like where we are as an industry and all of the different pieces of it so that newcomers can feel, um, you know, excited and empowered and educated and have a good time reading it. It doesn't dive into deep technical details. There's one ch chapter that satisfies if you have like a technical curiosity, then it will fill that need. but. You know, it's really not for that. Um, it's for more of the the high level, uh, you know, understanding the implications of the tech and less about how it works. Right. But I mean, which is good. That the fact that you're able to like paint a picture for the vast audiences of who this is, who this is for, right? And you don't have to be able to speak specifically to each of your audiences. You have to know who your audience is and like what is the message you're trying to get accomplished. And it sounds like initially it was, you know, friends and family and people who just want to, or board members or just your initial deep dive into, I know what, a, uh, I've heard of crypto. I've heard of a Bitcoin. I've heard of these things. Here's how I can go and learn more. And it, um, from, from this book, from, from Bitcoin Pizza, um, you've had the opportunity to go and speak across the world, spreading knowledge on cryptocurrency and blockchain. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, what has been some of the best lessons you've learned while traveling and what's been some of your like fondest moments? Oh, that's a great question. So, I mean, I typically, I came into this and the book has like a very strong argument in this direction of like, I think more about the high level concept of trust and decentralized trust and less less about so like we had centralized institutions and now it's moving that direction like of course blockchains are a manifestation of that bitcoin is a manifestation of it but it's impacting every industry education healthcare manufacturing you know you can basically find a way to see how that is impacting everything so the impacts that bitcoin or this notion um of decentralization 
had in the world is profound and people are feeling it everywhere. So that is something I've learned. I've recently had the opportunity to talk about more specific topics like open banking or, or DeFi um, in countries like Brazil or Chile. And literally a week after I left Chile, you know, there started, people started rioting and things like that. Um, the interesting thing I've found on the ground, like there, particularly in South America or like in Venezuela is a lot of people here, you know, stateside and myself included, like when Libra came out, uh, Facebook's Libra, you know, everyone here were like, Oh, it's, it's not, it's maybe good for the ecosystem, but it's generally not good. We don't want Facebook managing this stuff. Like it's messed up. Yeah. Bitcoin only. And then you go on, on the ground and I started asking people in Venezuela, like, what do you think about it? And they're like, we think it's great. It's better than what we have. And I was like, wow, I have such a sort of privileged view, um, you know, of, of these things. Uh, and I've also met people who are like, you know, I, it was a Coindesk reporter, Crypto Diana. She's incredible. I saw her speak when I was on this tour. I was not actually speaking. I attended uh, an event and she was just had incredible points coming from Venezuela herself being like, not kind of anti-Bitcoin, but just like when your power is out and you can't shower how's Bitcoin going to save you? And it was pretty facetious, but I think it, it was nice to have some much needed realism, especially from, you know, we have sort of this like, as Americans, patriarchal view of like, yes, Bitcoin will bring it to, you know, and unbank the unbanked and, and save Venezuela. And so it's been right. nice to travel. And on one hand, you're seeing incredible innovation, both in South America and, you know, across Africa. Um, and of course, Asia. And, that was a big learning experience of just kind of like getting out of the bubble and also like, I don't know, just like how big the divides are in terms of the the thinking of people in this industry and, and the fact that we are what I believe building the infrastructure for a better and more inclusive future. That is a true, that's, taking into account globalized and connected society versus people who are just very entrenched in the way that things are working now. And so my previous company, I worked in supply chain. I saw a lot of messed up stuff of like you, if you start tracking like where your cell phone comes from or where the food you eat comes from or where the, the drugs you take for pharmaceuticals, like anything, the farther you go up the supply chain, you always find up find out like really messed up things like slavery, yeah. human trafficking, like exploitation of our environment. Like it just so after seeing that for five years, I'm like, I really believe that we one economically, if we start there and like building a more inclusive future, but a lot of these entrenched industries don't want to change because the systems are just exactly. like working to the advantage of so many people. And I'm not the morality police. It's not my job to go out and say like, what's right or wrong. I think we generally know there are like some universal things and it makes me more passionate about it. So it's just, I've been amazed to see one, I have the benefit of ha having a platform where I, I get to be in rooms of people who are already halfway there. They're, excited and eager to learn about a more abundant and different future and they're ready to make change in their organizations or countries. Mm -hmm. uh, I give two types of talks actually. There's like the groups of people who are there and then there's like the hardcore privacy security like traditional industries and traditional industries I'm always just like oh my god I must seem like a whack job to these people <laughs> uh, because they're just so deeply entrenched in the system that, and I think they, they have no desire to change. So it's been illuminating to say the least. Right. And, and thank you for sharing all that insight with us. It's very eye opening and it's very humbling just to be able to see the real world, the real world cases, right. And, and, and how the economy of cryptocurrency and, and, and how just having 
value that can be used right now for what people need right now is very crucial and important. And in one of the points you're talking about of just a transparent future where, I mean, with putting things on the blockchain with the way that consensus has to happen and the, the way that it's becoming more global, I think it's moving in the right direction as well. And I think it is very important and is essential to the future of how the, the global economy works. Because quite frankly, yes, there's a lot of things wrong with it. Of course, there's things that work, but it's ultimately things are already moving in a different direction. And I, for one, believe that cryptocurrency is a viable solution. So I agree. <laughs> I mean, and I'm not pointing fingers. It's not like it was any single country or person's fault. It was just that we we used to trust place trust in like face to face interaction and in villages and in networks, and then all of a sudden we became global. Like globalization you know, facilitated by the industrial revolution and communications revolution happened really fast, like yes. really, really fast. In in the course of, if you look at the course of human history on a graph, it's just like exponential. It happened almost in a split second. And we obviously didn't have time to know what was going on or prepare or build, you know, anticipate this and build systems. So we just took a system that worked, you know, when we we're, in like a town or a village and then we put it on like a global village context and it didn't work and we had to put like all these intermediaries and place trust in more and more institutions which made the problem worse so again there's no fault like who we're all just you know learning along the way as people um but i think it's incredible it's so incredible to be part of a transformation that's not just like a technical technological innovation. So if you say, okay, the internet was big, it was cool, and mobile phones are it, big, of course, yeah, it connected everyone, but it isn't as big as this because this is like incorporating both a technological revolution with an ideological revolution, and that hasn't happened. I mean, the, I, it's just it's very exciting to me. I'm like, Extremely whoa. exciting. Yeah. yeah. And it's actually a great, that, I mean, that thought and that concept is a great transition into one of my next questions of, you know, what are some different cryptocurrency and blockchain projects that you in particular are really excited to watch develop? Great question. Uh, so again, I think of it in two ways. There's decentralization, which are not necessarily, it's more of an idea of concepts that are decentralizing certain industries, but, you know, maybe they're using a blockchain or distributed ledger. Maybe it's AI, maybe it's some other thing. Right. Um, So in that camp, I'm really interested in ways that we're decentralizing healthcare or education. So let's say in education, when I was in Chile, I met someone, his, his English was really great. And I'm like, where did you learn it? And it wasn't in school. It was playing video games. It's like the Spanish translation sucks. I play this game in English and now I learn English. So I'm like, why don't you get a language credit or certification, you know, something from that versus needing to go to some centralized institution, also known as a school. So that would be an example of like decentralized education, Uh, decentralized manufacturing. So instead of a factory, we have, you know, locally distributed, uh, you know, 3D printers, or 3D knitters or medicine printers or food printers, vertical farms, um, instead of shipping stuff all over the world. So there's that camp. And then there's like the legit, like actually using a blockchain for something. Um, I'm really, I came full circle because I spent some time in the enterprise world and I just, I think solving the world's monetary (laughs) challenges is a massive undertaking and probably the number one undertaking and a lot of problems can be solved by solving that so of course very interested in you know the crypto angle and the infrastructure to support bitcoin and uh you know accounting tools so talking about gilded you know my opinion on that is a lot of roadblocks to adoption on one hand it's education on the other hand it's just feeling comfortable or safe to transact like 
I'm not going to buy a coffee with this stuff if all if I think the government's going to come after me because I owe a bunch of taxes I didn't know how to account for. Um, so and then also I'm not going to trust an accountant who doesn't know anything about crypto. So I think there's that side of like we're still building the infrastructure, and then of course my you know my background in gaming. I think uh, gaming is so much more than a game. It's how people are collaborating and living, especially remote work. So I, you know, the example I give is like, you and I are already existing in the digital realm. We probably spend most of our day in front, you know, interfacing through a computer or a phone. Absolutely. And the interface sucks. You know, like I'm talking to you in like a TD, 2D, you know, either video or photo image or typing on a keyboard. And so the next realm is sort of these immersive experiences that are coming from gaming. So I think gaming will drive not just the future of, of course, leisure, but also life. And crypto, being able to account for and transfer um, your, you know, digital assets or qualifications or whatever it is, is, is very important in that context. Um, I mean, I could go on to, I'm excited about most things. I, I, yeah. like this, no, I, I just talked to a friend who, um, he's in California and with the wildfires, PG&E is like shutting down power for a bunch of people in California. Right. And I guess the, the town or city of Healdsburg in Sonoma County fully went off the PG&E grid, like PG&E being a hundred year or more old, like kind of institution or company who and built a grid that was completely centralized and I guess you can't turn off little sections of it. So they, <laughs> yeah. they moved off of this grid and became totally like an experiment in decentralization for energy. And I think that's fantastic. Like great. They have power. The rest of this like that part of the state has power shut down. So um you know, I'm I'm excited again, like whether I don't think Healdsburg is running on a blockchain, but if we imagine decentralization applying to areas of, uh, you know, public services, as well as like the corporate or private sector, it's uh, all of them excite me. Absolutely. And you, you touched on so many great points that uh, for everybody listening, I think you should go back and listen to there's there's just so much up and coming in so many ways that this space is going to be impacted in impacting the world. It's it it's just you don't just need Google to like it. just Google it <laughs> and like don't get overwhelmed by all of it. Just find something that stick like it resonates with you and let that be your first deep dive into it. And then you can start to look at some of these other industries and other things that you want to understand. But it's there's just think, so much. I think that's an amazing point of advice, actually. So for me, I you know, everyone has their own interests and they come into worlds through different approaches or angles. But you know, if you're in the healthcare sector, if you're a teacher, or like I've given talks and literally to it was to the all the convention for all of the CEOs of the trade associations in America. So there's basically people who represented every industry that exists. And there's some that you don't even know about. And like the right. head of the funeral directors of America came up and was like, this is amazing. I can see how blockchain can impact my industry. And I was like, what? Number one, I've never even thought about you. Is it or like floriculture, <laughs> right. like the flower industry is talking to them. And I'm like these, this is crazy. But like, whatever your interest or your industry or just like things that, you know, I didn't talk about, um, energy, for example, I didn't deep dive into energy grids in the, in my book, but yet my friend who I sent it to, um, was reading it recently and he calls me right away. And he's the one who told me this example of like, we could use blockchain to solve the problem of, of, uh, you know, California's energy grids. And so I think if you look, if you have an interest and you have an industry and you have a problem to solve, you know, not like this technology or this idea solves every problem, but it's definitely a way to get into it. Oh, hundred percent. And I, I thank you for elaborating on that. And, and I, I think the biggest point that Sam's driving on right now, y'all is find something that resonates with you and just start 
And 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 with that, Sam, thank you so much for for spending time with us and just dropping a plethora of knowledge on us. But before you leave, what is a final thought that you want to leave with everyone listening today? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me, and thank you for everyone listening for listening to our conversation or more of like my crazy ranting. I want to flip this and do an interview of you next time. <laughs> gotcha. But. Um, I guess the bit of feedback that I have is to, I mean, we're all lifelong learners in this experience. No one's an expert. And even if you're new coming to the space, you're just as much of a student as I am. And so approach it with enthusiasm and and optimism and stay humble. Uh, And yeah, like let's work together to build some stuff for a better future. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that's a great thing to end on. It's, it's, we're in a point of collaboration. We're in a point of getting something amazing and seeing it fly. And if you can get in sooner than later, you're going to be very happy that you did it. So Sam, thank you so much again for, for spending the time with us today, dropping all this knowledge. What are some different ways that people can connect with you um, that are listening? For sure. Uh, so as with most crypto people, if you're new to the crypto space, there are a lot of people who hang out on Twitter. So on Twitter, I am at Sam Rad Official. And if you're into other social networks, that's also my handle on, on Instagram and Facebook and all the other things. Uh, I have a website. You can, If you're interested in the book, you can find Bitcoin Pizza, the book on Amazon, or go to bitcoinpizza.com for some additional information, not just the book, but also, you know, getting your hands dirty, getting your hands on some uh, crypto, buying some pizza with it. So, you know, uh, whatever is of interest to you. Perfect. Well, again, everyone that's listening, uh, just want to thank Sam for coming on and please go connect with her. She has some really, really, really good info that I went and checked out on both her website or social media is popping. And there's, there's a ton that you can learn from her. And again, for everyone that's listening, stay CryptoCurrent. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of CryptoCurrent. For more information on this episode and all of our episodes, please visit us at www.crypto-current.co. Stay up to date with the latest news in cryptocurrency. You'll receive daily emails Monday through Friday that are personalized and curated content specific to you and your interest, powered by artificial intelligence. Are you an accredited investor looking to invest in cryptocurrency? Crescent City Capital can help. Go to crescentcitycapital.com for more information. If you're finding value in our content, please take five minutes to leave a five-star review and a great comment. Also, please make sure to share this podcast with others. Hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the quality of this podcast. I can only thank my amazing producer, Andrew DeRitter, with DeRitter Productions, who has put this together. If you have any podcast, visual, or video needs, please go to DeRitterProductions.com. That's D-E-R-I-T-T-E-R Productions.com. This has been another episode of Crypto Current, bringing you one step closer to becoming a crypto and blockchain aficionado. We look forward to giving you the latest in crypto news and analyses next week. Stay crypto current. Please use available exits now.